Hello everyone, I am Eric Kazadi and I'm joined here by Daniel as well as Wairimu as a part of the WSDC 2022 CAP. This video is going to serve as a part of our broader judge training and this in this video in particular, we're going to be focusing on tracking as well as scoring of speeches. This is of course very important and vital because this is how you take notes and also it's it is with regards to how you are going to be able to synthesize clashes as well as track the progression of teams cases and the engagement between the two teams. Also under a conferral system, this is even more important because given that you will be discussing the uh, debate with your other judges before crossing your individual ballot, it is even more so important that everyone has a clear set of notes and clearly evaluates and tracks the way in which the debate occurs. So the way this video would function is we will first start with a brief discussion on why it is important for judges to track well, following which we will be watching a debate, i.e. we'll screen share a debate. And after the first two speech exchanges, Daniel would go through their notes as well as synthesize the way in which clashes uh, arose after the first two speeches, or rather the first two first speeches, the, first, the two first speeches on either side, and then evaluate those clashes, who is ahead and why following which I will do the same for the second speeches. And as a part of this broader discussion, we'll also provide assistance on how to score speeches, uh, uh, which is also a vital part of the WSCC process, given that the entire tournament, although it has two different divisions, the speakers tab will be combined. So scoring, so scoring and score calibration is also pretty vital for us. And hopefully this video would assist with that. So to kick things off, I'd like to hand over to Daniel on a for a brief, uh, information on for brief information on why tracking is important. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Uh, thank you, Eric. So firstly, let's understand what is tracking. So tracking basically is you taking note of what each speaker has claimed, the unique reasons, the mechanisms that they offer to support their claim. So the point of tracking is to remind you of what was said by each speaker throughout the round, what are which are crucial when you're weighing up whether a claim was well proven or well responded to, or what a speaker or team has done, and et cetera. The other point of tracking is also so that you can participate better by being as specific as possible in the judge deliberation, be it as a chair or as a wing. However, you also don't want your notes to simply be a list of things that were mentioned in the round. You want your notes to help you. You want to note that allows you to quickly go through each team contribution for an hour long debate on mostly only two minutes after the debate ended and before the deliberation started. And that's why note taking and tracking is really important to master. Uh, I will now share how do I take my note, what do I write, and the tips that I have on tracking. For my note taking, I use Google Docs or Word. So I just make a table where each speaker gets a column and I write what they say there. I mark the heading of the argument, the heading of a layer, and importantly, they, they set in bold so I can easily go there when I'm making my decision. Then I'll usually make comments on the material with short sentence below the claim to help me remember what I was thinking on what they were arguing on that particular material. Either they are missing new ones, or was it a contradiction? Was it an entirely new material, et cetera? So what do I write? Uh, it is usually case for case basis, depending on the level of the speaker and how much material that they are giving me to the level of the room, and et cetera. But in general, I write as much as I can. I type word by word, but not necessarily word by word, because uh, my concern about uh, writing down only the big idea is you might miss nuance of the argument that could play a very important role in the verdict later. So I usually avoid that. I usually try to type as much as possible, as much as I can. This is also so that I'm using the speaker's wording as much as possible because different wording can also rescue either under or over crediting a claim. So from my experience, I, I think I have three suggestions that I want to share. Number one is what you potentially should do, either if you're using paper or laptop, is to find a way to highlight 
the more important part of a speech or a team case. I think the reason is it allows you to access that quicker so you don't have to dive deep into the entire material again. You can highlight this as the speech goes on or by the end of every speech. In addition, you could also make note on the big picture of the debate as the debate is going on. How is it going on? What were your thoughts when you heard a claim? Do you find a point persuasive or not, or any thoughts that might be important later when you're evaluating an argument or in feedback later to your team. So you can put them in different color. I usually either highlight this with a different color or put it on intellect so I can go back easily on these small points. Uh, the second tip and suggestion that I want to share is to still make note on material that you think are less relevant to the right now as the speaker was speaking, because uh, those framings are a context or rebuttal that you think might not be relevant right now, might be relevant and contentious later on when their opponent pointed that out. So you want to make sure you have reference or uh, you note down the contributions or on your note. Lastly, and specifically on WSDC format, on tracking POI, I, I do think many judges do not really care about POI, but uh, POIs are actually a good debate, especially in WSD format. There's a POI adjustment column where you mark the content of the POI and the speakers will be able to respond to set POIs. Other than that, I, I do think POIs are generally important to value engagement between the team. So it's important to note them down. Uh, from my experience, I learned that note taking is a learned skill. There's no nothing such as like one way of tracking is better than the other. So what I would recommend for you is to experiment, is to experiment with different things to see what works best for you. I used to write on paper, but I found it less effective later on because I ended up struggling to read my own handwriting because I was noting down material and rush in my handwriting, mostly is really small. So you might want to try tracking on a computer, on a Word, on Excel, or on paper if you haven't done so, on a single sheet of paper for multiple speeches, or et cetera. The point is, it doesn't matter which method that you use as long as that method allows you to be able to take notes in a well-organized and structured way uh, so that you can recall the arguments of the debate by each speaker. Uh, yep, that is from me on the tips on tracking. I'll pass it to you. Yeah, thank you for that, Daniel. Uh, I do believe that many judges would hopefully find that insightful. And also just as an illustration of that, as mentioned earlier, we will be going through a debate, or at least the first four speeches of the debate. And after each exchange, we will be sharing our notes uh, for you to compare and contrast with your own notes, as well as synthesizing clashes in real time with you through this video. And hopefully you find that to be a very useful mechanism to learn about. So yeah, at this point, I'm going to share my screen with the debate. Uh, and I just would like confirmation that everything is visible. Please remember that it is eight minute speeches. So I will send timestamps to the chat. Uh, and yeah, I think that's about it. Um, you can state your POI preference as well before you start your speech. Everyone has the motion already. I'll just send it again to the chat. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the prime minister here, here. Audible? Yes, you are. Okay. We regret the narrative that private banks are trying to sell to us just so that they can get more loanable funds to get more profit. That if you're spending money for your own self growth and investment in yourself, you should be scrutinized in society. We say the effect is harsh, especially on low income individuals who are then pressured to save even when they could have been investing in themselves and their future 
for their families. Two arguments in my speech. First, why this actually gives you more financial stability. I'm going to flip um, opposition's case right away. And second of all, even if you don't buy the first argument, why this actually gives you more happiness. Before that, a few notes on framing. First, what does this narrative actually look like? I think um, right now in the status quo, when there's a widespread narrative to save a, signif a significant portion of their income, this looks like peer pressure to save. There's a stigma, for example, where people who save are educated, they care about their family, They're, they actually care about themselves in the long term are, and are not reckless. This is why most bank and investment advertisements are usually family centered. The only way that you can be a good father is if you save, is if you actually um, have these investments. But second, it also looks like scrutinizing, splurging on yourself either this be for like self-care or just personal enjoyment in the present a mom spending a lot of her money for example is scrutinized by her neighbors that she doesn't care about her children but i think on both sides presumably the rich would be able to have enough money to have like uh, to spend their significant portion of their income and not have any harms in this that means in this debate we're actually talking about the marginal individuals those in low income uh, societies that actually have a choice either to save money or to invest in themselves for long-term growth we don't I don't think on either side people are going to spend their money to the point of bankruptcy though because like obviously um like humans are risk averse they want to survive to weather against the fluctuations of life probably they would um still be saving but instead of uh, saving a majority of their income say 80 percent they would be spending like 20 to 30 percent instead other mitigatory mechanisms also already exist in the status quo so this looks like free health care free education where governments are able to Is do that like not frozen for anyone else uh, no. 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 Hi, Katiana. You were frozen just now, I think. Um. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. I uh, so. Huh? I I think that was just you, Kat. Oh, that was just me. Yeah. There is your Wi-Fi. Um. Everyone else is fine. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll just um, just continue on from wherever you you left off, then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this looks like healthcare and free education. So the burden of side opposition in this debate isn't just to prove why long-term investments are so beneficial, but also why you need to be saving so much in your contingency funds just to survive. First arguments then, why this actually gives you more financial stability. The premise of this argument is that money is not always a good investment. Why? Firstly, note that on their side, you're actively encouraging the population to save their money instead of spending it. But this is harmful because money actually depreciates over time. Most private banks lure in customers with high interest rates, but these interest rates are actually never enough to cover up the high inflation rates in the country because of the fluctuative and unstable nature of the economy in the first place. Literally, when the pandemic hit, we had fluctuative interest rates all over the world. The reason why most of the time low interest rates exist is exactly because banks also want to keep up um, more profits and are profit driven. Ultimately, what this means in the end is that people are actually losing their money through financial investments. On our side, uh, on their side, it's much, much worse because they're literally saving 80% of their income. Why is a diversified investment comparatively better than? What do I mean by this? Often investing in, uh, this looks like investing in skills, taking online courses is usually beaten out by the narrative that you should save for your college funds without realizing that uh, obviously colleges also look for you being able to have more skills. What are the benefits of this? Firstly, because unlike money saved up, these skills actually gained by these individuals have two crucial characteristics. First, they don't diminish and depreciate over time. Unlike financial investments, skills actually build up exponentially. So taking up one course on computer science through course era, for example, literally opens up doors for you to become a data scientist, a software engineer, and that literally becomes a snowball effect that opens up so much more opportunities for that. But second, the returns are also literally instantaneous. The problem with financial investments is that you would actually never know when the benefits are going to trickle down or it even will uh, trickle down in the end of the day. At least on our side of the house, when you have when you're able to invest in skills and uh, courses for yourself, you know that you're, you're instantaneously going to be more skillful and you're obviously going to get more opportunity for that. 
Why is this important? Because right now, a lot of low income individuals are getting left behind in the developing economy exactly because they're stuck in their menial jobs, where coal miners are losing their jobs and because they don't have transferable skills to move to different industries that are booming in the demand in the economy. This is most harmful to low income individuals who would actually otherwise not be able to live. Sure, in some instances, maybe we say money might be a good investment. However, I think absent this narrative, people are not forced to go for the option of saving. Rather, they would choose instead what is most strategic for them to do so. Absent this narrative, I think there's going to be a wide range of views forward, forwarded by different influencers, life coaches, coaches and etc which all serve to counterbalance each other and create the best decision possible secondly people are more willing to invest in things such as real estate on our side comparatively obviously people also have the same invest uh, in incentives that op will posit in their arguments things like wanting to grow their uh, money wanting to survive wanting to get richer they won't just be spending on luxury items probably they're also going to be doing things like buying real estate to start a business why because there's a capitalist notion in our society that you're never like enough right now that you should never be content with your financial security and that you should always strive to become more well off. This is good because at least on our side, there's a potential for the money to grow and create returns. Even though it's risky, at least people are likely to teach each other about the safe way of investing, for example, of how much you should first invest uh, before you move on to more risky investments. Second argument, even if you don't buy our first argument, why on our side of the house do you get much more happiness? Several reasons why this is true. First, Spending more money leads to a better quality of life. On our side, you get more disposable income for entertainment. Things like spending on traveling, fancy dining, going to movies. On their side, you literally have no money left after your income has been eaten up by all your savings. Actually, before I continue, any POIs? Hi, yeah. Okay. Can you please be clear with your characterization? Do you think people will spend this money on disposable income like you just said, or will people put this into investing more skills? You can't do both. Yeah, on our side of the house, you can do both because investing in more skills isn't saving up. Investing into yourself by getting like courses, for example, buying real estate to start a business that isn't saving up in your in your like bank account, that's actually like spending money in the economy. Continuing on my point then, on their side, you literally have no money left after your income has been eaten up um, by taxes, by savings, and etc. And this literally has manifested into this capitalistic notion where you can only enjoy your life after retirement. On our side, we give individuals the choice to find fulfillment in what way they can. Maybe some people are materialistic, so this is completely valid then. They can buy things and make them happy in the short run. Why is this especially important? Because notice that there is no certainty that you will actually be able to use the money in your savings in the long run. At least under our side of the house, there's more certainty in the benefits you're getting by spending the money the way you choose to. Second reason, saving a significant portion of your money also tends to lead to more stress. We say this is especially like true for individuals who are working low income jobs, working nine to five jobs that are extremely stressful. Construction workers, we say that they actually deserve the opportunity to do things like buy cigarette to do things like spend more of their money so that they can actually survive through the life that they're given um we think that it's so it's extremely justifiable for this on their side you scrutinize these individuals and make their lives worse for those reasons we're so proud to propose thank you to the prime minister for that speech now i'd like to welcome the leader of opposition to deliver theirs here here Hi, I'm audible. Yes, you are. Okay. I'm going to start in three, two, what? Ah, before that, POI to uh, just unmute yourself. Starting in three, two, one. I think that to spend money in a short term benefit is not going to create any further benefit, right? Because exactly what Katiana told you in her speech, she were, she were talking about she was talking about how the capitalistic notion still exists, right? Which means if the capitalistic notion in this case still exists, peoples or individuals on the ground tend to pursue their own happiness in a much more in a much more massive scale. Right? For, for example, they tend to exactly do, doing like doing like 
spending their money in something that's not very beneficial, which is rates and etc., which precisely occur because they do, because they have like very very big amount of the money that they don't exactly save into the financial account, which I'm going to explain it further on my argument, right? So two pieces of setup before I'm going to my argumentation. The first of all, I think that under the options of the house, the method that we are using in this case is basically we would like to highly recommend or even like highly expose like the method of like how you can save in like in the bank account, for example, like percentage of income, like 50% of your income after tax to the saving, right? We will exclude the investment, like the stock market in this case, for example, on our side house, because it seems too certain to answer that for a certain period because the stock market itself is too is too fluctuative right but secondly we think under our set house the main method is to put money in the bank right like you can get five, five, uh, like five percent a year back more like investment on the gold for instance to become like to become like make your investment become sustainable under our set house so before that though i'll just put like one independent rebuttal to the katiana talking about the social 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 societal backlash right three responses to this number one i don't understand why is this true right because it seems impossible when we're talking about a certain method of savings of course it's somehow the nature of saving like bank account and etc it's somehow privacy right your neighbors will not know like the amount of money that you're saving in this case that is why on your side house the judgmental or even like some kind of the narrative or stigma that exists will not going to be occurred because we think that every individuals, even like unprivileged individuals, don't know like the amount of money and they, they don't want to compare each other like your amount, like how much you, you're saving in your bank account, right? But secondly, we think saving exists on a much more different segmentation, right? If you are, let's say, unprivileged individuals, of course, you are not familiar with the existence of the stock market, this is still okay, right? You can opt into a manual saving method or mechanism in this case, like go into the bank account, etc. Even like invest in the gold, this is far more sustainable. That is the value of the gold is not something that's like fluctuative too much compared to the stock market in this case if you are privileged individuals let's say in this case you can opt into the stock market because you had a lot of capital right that's why under our set house the guarantee of how unprivileged individuals will likely to become get sustainability in terms of their life will likely to be excess right but we third response to this right more if we don't spend this on saving they will spend spend this on like pursuing your happiness etc but more of it thing like to release their stress as a coping mechanism they will do this excessively right because yo i had a lot of money in this case that is to say because we live in the capitalistic world you like you will like pursue your you will like to pursue much more your happiness in this case but more i think that Katiana have addressed how on the house after they are not working in the private space after they are retired for example how can they get like sustainability in terms of the money etc right because if they cannot prove this then they cannot exactly protect the vulnerable actors which we think is far more which we think is far more important to be judged upon like talking about the vulnerable people right to uh, two pieces of argument I would like to bring this case. Firstly, why is finances, financial sustainability is absolutely crucial? But number two, I'm going to talk about why the happiness under our house is a far more qualified happiness compared to the size of the population, right? So first argument then, why is financial sustainability cr crucial? Two reasons in here. First of all, I think we should bring the idea of urgency in this case, which is far more sustainable. We think that how the way this debate is just is to address more other vulnerable actors, are, which are the unprivileged individuals, right? They don't have any income in the condition where they are retired, or like the blue collar, or even like laborers in this case, they didn't have that much income when they are working, right? Because, like, for instance, there's no, in the certain developing countries, for example, there's no labor protection, right? Or even like there is a labor protection, but it's only like for minimum cap fee, which is like too little for them to spend it into like their happiness, etc., right? That is to say, on this other house, the more vulnerable actors will not going to be protected anyway because of course they went into a retirement process there are my two different things that occur in here the first one is like they will depend on the government aid or their children or their family right this is still bad because understand we cannot rely everything on the government right because government has also much more priority to be prioritized in this case like they basically infrastructures, economic development, etc., etc. I think the government will try to prioritize those first, rather giving the aid for those other individuals, right? That is to say, when this has happened, you'll try to rely on your family, on your children, for instance, create a lot of pressure for them to keep funding their parents in the end, right? Which, of course, we're doing children anyway. Like, your children cannot pursue, like, their own interests or, or their own needs because, in general, they need to help, like, and funding their parents, right? But secondly, they will try to work anyway in this case, right? If this is a cure for the old individuals like veteran, etc., I think they have incentive to pursue like their interest in this case to survive, of course. Let's say when this is a cure, of course, they will offer work themselves, right? More, they got less income in this case, with far more risk, of course. Like complicated, this is because your physical condition is not exists on a prime condition. That is to say, you will get a lot more complication, like physical like physical disease and etc. With, of course, spending a lot of money in this case, even you are overworking yourself, right? After you got into the retirement process, right? 
but totally even if you don't yeah. like this argument kan uh, no thank you you got the rationality to not spend that much i don't understand like why every individual suddenly have this awareness right of course especially for the unprivileged individuals they don't know how saving is very worth it, right it's based on their point of view how point of view is somehow saved by your, like your education etc right but moreover if we as the society or as society keep this narrative or even like as the government keep this narrative as a whole meaning there will be many individuals like especially unprivileged individuals who will opt into this choice right saving as an option that is to say we will be getting much more sustainable after the retirement of europe which of course after retirement you don't want to be a burden for everyone like or even like you, your family or even like government etc you want to like achieve internal peace in this case that is to say when you want to right. achieve like internal peace in this case you don't want to overwork yourself you don't want to become a burden for your family to put like much expectation for them in this case right but second of all why is this important right two reasons because number one sustainability of income in this case meaning the happiness right. after you can achieve no thank you after you can achieve this case right it should become more accessible for the choices of course we can guarantee more accessibility for those unprivileged individuals because when they get like saving in a much more massive scale at least even if the saving is not that much this is still okay because you can still get a lot of survivability right basic needs etc that is obviously exclusive on our side of house when we are not up into like these choices to spend like short for the short term happiness but number two more on our side of house the worst is that we can prevent how unprivileged individuals are To not, to not become a burden in the very first place like become a beggar on the streets for instance become a yeah. burden for the society in general in the very first place because I, before i'm going to talk about why does happiness fall under the definition of stability i'll take your POI. given that spending excessively leads to all the harms you say why won't people like influencers and up the narrative that instead you should invest instead of like gambling and wasting all your money uh, i'm going to explain it in my second argument why does happiness fall under the definition of stability right The first reason is that comparison to the prop happiness, it is like short term and sometimes superficial, right? First of all, the idea of the short term happiness, like the narrative that you only live once, for example, sure, okay, that's maybe good anyway, but it's only bring you like the in an instant moment, you just enjoy this one, right? This is not the qualified happiness, of course, because you have like more, because you have like more thing that exactly save your point of view, like society, and as well, they pressure you to exactly to exactly expand this into like. To exactly spend this like into having fun, retire into having fun, like recreation, like cigarette, and etc. That is precisely when this has happened. Of course, all of those individuals will exactly will exactly like opt into this kind of the choices, right? Because the perception is saved by society because it's like the capitalistic world that got you and fold you. But second of all, of course, the like influencer etc. will have the incentive to exactly post this in the very first place, right? Because influencer also have like some certain contracts with like companies or even like bank, for example, to exactly promote this narrative in the very first place. That is also give a beneficial this also give a significant amount for them like salary and etc to be trade off to like promote this narrative in the very first place. But secondly, we think that the company being profitable is something that's common, right? But at least on our side house we can protect the much more much more vulnerable actors in this case. That's why best follow up the reason proud to oppose. Thank you to the leader of opposition for that speech. Great uh, that comes up the video uh, that we are using uh, for the example of tracking. Uh, but before we, uh, I share my notes and, dis- and we discuss the first few exchanges, uh, let's talk about how we judge the debate after we track. So the first process is to identify issues or clashes. And there are three broad ways that you can do that. The first process is And the most obvious one is to listen to debate and the debaters will tell you what those issues are. In most cases, the debaters will say, here are the issues in the debate or here are my arguments for the debate. And that will be the cue to understand what issues exist in the round. But in the case in which the debaters do not explicitly flag those issues or contributions, What you can do is to track and validate arguments and engagement throughout the round. So if mostly debaters were talking about whether it's justified to do X, then that will be one of the clashes in the debate. Is it justified to do X? And if the debaters were talking about the impact of doing X, then that could also become another issue. So the point here is to just track the debate as well as you can, because if you track the debate and you understood what each speaker is saying, then that will allow you to make correct identification of issues. Um, there are also instances where there's no direct or significant clash initially in the first speaker's speech, 
And in that case, what you do is to identify what issues came about in the debate or emerged in the debate later on. I'm referring to the second and third speeches. So if the second speaker brought a new contentious material that will also count as an issue as that speaker technically are also allowed to bring in arguments. So remember that issues are not just what the first speaker provide in the debate, but it's also about what other speaker provide throughout the debate. So make sure you listen throughout the debate and not just the specific speaker. I think the last thing to note here is judges are supposed to evaluate what is in the debate and not what they feel is supposed to be in the debate. So make sure you ask yourself what became the most important issues in the debate and who won those issues effectively to arguments and rebuttal provided in the round and what what and not what you issue were presented or what you thought should have been presented. And after you identify those issues, then you weigh the issues because the team who wins might not always be the team who wins the most issues, but the most important issues. Uh, there are four different ways that you can bring issues. The first is to observe what teams explicitly agree as important. So if the first proposition says that it is important to uplift the social economic mobility of minorities, and therefore we should uh, uh, support affirmative action as the solution towards it. And then the first opposition says that we agree that we have to protect minority, but I'm offering you this counter model that uplifts minority better. Thus far, we can arrive in one conclusion that both teams agree that it's important to uplift minority groups. The question then becomes which side proves that their mechanism work better. So if both teams agree on what issue being more important, the issue ended up becoming the more important issues rather than the other issues in the debate. Secondly, if it is unclear on what the teams agree as important, then you should ask yourself what the team implicitly agree as important. So for example, if they talk about the vulnerabilities of minorities a lot, you could imply that both teams agree that protecting minorities is an important issue in the debate because they are so vulnerable. Uh, but if that's still not clear, then weigh the reasons given by the team on why particular issue is more important than the other uh, issues in the round. So for example, if a team says something like practical argument is more important than principal argument because the principle of X is contingent on the practical argument and there's no sufficient response from the other side challenging this metric, then you can assume that this issue is more important issue because the team has made it explicit that this is the metric that you should judge the debate upon. Lastly, if there's an instance where there's no explicit weighing done by team whatsoever, and there's no implicit or explicit concession on what are important, only then that you can enter the debate as an average intelligent voter to determine what issues are more important. But a thing to note is this is very, 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 very unlikely that you have to do this because Usually teams will tell you which arguments most important is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, and then you assess then to what degree that the argument is proven and the importance is proven by them. And then you judge based on that metric. From the video of first and second exchange, so after you track and take note, you come with identification of issues. But before that, I'll show the notes that I took throughout these speeches. Uh, Eric, can you enable participant to share screen? Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, let me do that now. Okay, you can try that. Great. Uh, uh, can everyone see my screen now? Yes, it's good. So this is the note that I took throughout these speeches. Um, so I use a very simple note taking process. So I take note via Google Docs. I just make a table where each speaker got one column. So I, I told you in the beginning of the session that I have the tendency to type as much as I can because I am afraid of losing new ones or I just want to use as much as similar as wording that the speaker uses. So what I did was highlight the main part, 
like the main part of the arguments, the assertion, the framing, and the heading of the layer, such as like framing, what does this narrative look like? Argument one, financial stability. The first layer was about money is not a good investment. Second layer was about why is diversified investment, investing in skill and online courses better. And other than that, I just bolt down the important mechanisms in the speeches. For example, I will bolt down the first mechanism that people are not going to spend recklessly because people are risk averse uh, or something that's important. For example, when Prop was pushing the burden to opt to prove that you have to save so much in contingency fund just to survive for op benefit to run. But also things like link back impacting our note, which part of the speech are we on? And then, uh, for example, like this, the mechanisms and the link back, the link back was like uh, the other counterfactual was to let individual choose what is strategic for them to do. And some other mechanisms like wide range of views forwarded by different influencer life coaches that counterbalance each other to help individual make the best decision possible. I also note that the POI in Italy, and I'll just assess from that whether the POI given was strategic and how the uh, speaker responded to the POI. Uh, the same goes with the lead of opposition, the response. I usually will name what the response is responding towards. In this case, it was responding towards societal backlash. And I'll note the layer of their responses as well. Uh, I'm not saying that you have to type literally word by word. Uh, it, it, it is quite dependent on your type of judging. Uh, in my case, I, I like writing word by word, although I, I'm not saying that this is the best way to track. I, I do find this useful, especially when I want to recall the mechanism that each team brought, just to make sure that I do not leave anything out. Yep, I hope the notes were clear. Uh, I, I could, uh, attach the link in the video if you want to access my note for later on. Then from that, uh, we'll perhaps discuss on the how I saw the issues, and how, how I saw the team's interaction uh, between P1 and O1. So the first thing I did was to identify issues that happened throughout the round. I think the issues during the first year exchanges were quite clear and straightforward. Uh, there's a clash on which side provides financial stability better and which side makes individuals more happy. I think it was explicitly flagged in the first speech and it was made contentious by the first opposition. So we'll go through each clash and discuss the material brought by P1 and O1. So on financial stability, I think, I think overall, after watching the overall exchange, I think there are two main questions that we have to ask ourselves as genders. So the first one is on whether individuals are more likely to invest in self-improvement, like skill training and online courses, like our prop set, or are they likely to spend their money recklessly, like what offset? And thus far, the first conclusion that I arrived at was that proposition plus gave me way more mechanisms to prove why individuals are likely to invest in self-improvement rather than reckless spending. I think there are three particular mechanisms for by DPM that I noted down. Number one is people are risk first. They want to survive the weather against the fluctuations of life. Number two, the capitalist notion that tells people to never be content. Number three, the positive devices forwarded by influence or life coaches that counterbalance each other, make sure that individual have the information necessary to make the best decision possible, of which sufficiently illustrate why the vast majority of individuals are likely to invest in self-improvement rather than making reckless decisions. In contrast, I want to then assess the strongest opposition reason that shows why people are more likely to be reckless. And that is because we live in capitalist society where people tend to spend. So my first observation on this exchange was that opposition response didn't negate proposition claim and framing. And that is because proposition was not trying to prove that people will not spend any of their money on entertainment at all. But proposition was framing and was trying to prove is that 
people are likely to spend the majority of their money on self-improvement apps and to this narrative, and it still can go hand in hand with spending some few portion of their money in entertainment. And this also resolved the POI given by opposition. To be. So to be clear, I think proposition framed from the start that it is not within their burden to say that people will not save at all because their counterfactual is absent to this narrative. People diversify investment on what they think are most strategic for them and by incentive that they analyze, they prove that people are still likely to save some portion of their money and thus making the concern on safety net more marginal on opposition. And if we think about it as an average result voter, I think the framing is quite fair considering the motion only necessity proposition to regret the narrative that people should save a significant portion of their income and it does not mean absent to this narrative people will not save at all. Secondly, but even if not, I think opposition just like the analysis on why capitalist tendencies on spanning overweigh the intrinsic incentive of humans to be risk adverse and all the three other mechanism proposition provided. And thus far, I do not think there's sufficient attack by the opposition one on each of these three mechanisms that proposition provided. So large chunk of mechanism to prove the claim still stand on proposition. Now, the second question that we'll like to ask is on the value of money as investment. I think PM from the start have illustrated that money depreciates over time. There are high inflation rates because of the fluctuation and unstable nature of economy, et cetera. In contrast, when you invest in skill training, the skill gain up by individual do not diminish and depreciate over time. Rather, if you take a course on computer science, it opens door an opportunity to be a software engineer and it gives transferability of skills to move to different industries that are booming in demand. I think thus far, the first thing to note is opposition did not have a mechanistic response to this beyond an assertion that if you save money in bank, then you get in return plus 5%. No response at all at proposition mechanism on depreciation of the value of the money. And this is quite damning to them because strategically what proposition was saying was that money is not a good investment. The better investment is investing on skills, training and real estate, which is the counterfactual that proposition was supporting. To that, and then proposition was able to co-opt the future benefits of financial stability insofar as proposition claim on why these are better investment. And therefore they are also going to contribute well to the future financial stability when you have better education and better work opportunities in the future. Insofar as they still stand, I don't think opposition benefit uh, stand because opposition benefit did not only get mitigated to this extent, but also flipped insofar as they could not prove why money is a better form of investment other than proposition counterfactual. I think in addition to that, I think PM also strategically made group preemptions. Firstly, by claiming that in instance when there's inflation, opposition is worst because they save majority of their money there. This is a small but strategic contribution and worth being noted down because in case if opposition later speak abroad, their response that inflation is symmetric and therefore it's not exclusive harm. I do think proposition still prove that opposition loses much more money because they save it rather than spending it. Secondly, I think in time of crisis, I think proposition made the benefit clear from the start that different with money that might depreciate once inflation happens or in terms of crises, skills and knowledge do not diminish and you still get the transferability of skills to weather against that crisis better. So the margin was clear on proposition. And therefore thus far, I think on the first exchange and first clash, proposition was ahead from opposition because A, they were able to provide individuals are more likely to invest their income in self-improvement, but also B, they also proof and show why investment will result in better financial security in the long run, as opposed to money that appreciate in value over time, flipping opposition claim on financial security. Then the second class I want to talk about is on happiness. And I think the first thing to probably observe is that on opposition framing uh, that says that there will be no social 
backlash because saving is private. Uh, I think that framing is right, it is fair, but if you evaluate the impact of that framing to the overall debate and case, they'll realize that this particular framing undercut the benefit of opposition as well, because opposition benefits technically can only be enforced by societal backlash. Because if opposition characterization of humans being reckless inherently is true, then it's unclear why absent the backlash, people will want to save rather than suspend. So the mitigation does not work for me. In contrast, I think the claim from Proposition 1 was clear that the narrative increases the quality of life by individual, especially for a lower income worker, such as construction worker, because now they cannot buy cigarettes without being scrutinized and pressure first by society to save. The second thing to outline here is opposition did not negate proposition benefit on the happiness, on having more disposable income allocated for entertainment. The only response was it is short term. And we ought to care for long term because when you're old, you cannot rely on government and your children. And that's why you have to have safety income. I think thus far, there are several observations to be made. One, because proposition says that people are still going to save absent to this narrative, I think opposition benefit became in inclusive insofar as they do not provide long-term stability or require a huge amount of saving instead of just saving some portion of our income being saved. I think this was specifically pointed out as the burden pushed by PM to Ella. Secondly, even if not, I think PM did preempt this by saying that there has a mitigatory mechanism in status quo, such as free education of healthcare and government program. I think the leader of opposition did contend that you cannot rely on government because they have many areas to focus on infrastructure and et cetera. I think the problem with this claim was it was relatively asserted why government cannot focus on both and why it's mutually exclusive. But I also am willing to agree that there was also lack of analysis by proposition thus far. So we might need more information down the bench to resolve this particular observation. But most importantly, I think the problem with opposition also is that there's very little way beyond the assertion that in the short term to prove why being happy in short term is really that bad. I think proposition on the other hand does a pretty clear job at weighing that says that there's no certainty that they can use money in the, the saving in the long run and there's more certainty of spending and investing. And therefore, even if it's for short term happiness, is worth better in terms of certainty on whether you can use money or not. Yep, uh, that concludes my observation and how I saw the issues in the round and how I uh, thought that proposition was thus far had from opposition in the first speaker exchanges. Now I'm going to pass the floor to Eric to explain on the second speaker exchanges. Thank you so much for that, Daniel. Uh, very thorough and comprehensive. So similarly, we will now play the second exchanges after which I will point out my observations as well as track the progression of the clashes in the round. Um, and worth noting here that I do agree broadly with Daniel's uh, clashes as well as the assessment of those clashes and we will see how that progresses after the second speeches. Okay, I shall resume sharing. I'll assume it's still visible and audible, so. Now, I would like to welcome the Deputy Prime Minister to deliver theirs. Here, here. Yes, you are. Speech will start in three, two, one. Panels, so when we choose to uh, to have more money under our side, this does not simply mean that we're going to splurge all of it, right? We're still going to spend it in a very realistic way, right? And our stance in this debate is that we don't want a significant portion of our income to be saved. Instead, um, we would choose uh, other alternatives, for example, saving only 20 to 30 percent of our income. So at the end of the day, we are still able to achieve uh, financial stability on the long run. And I'll explain to you why under their side, it is much uh, less sustainable when you try to save around 80 percent of your income. Right now, one rebuttal towards opposition side. 
the opposition side told you that bank is the best way to save your money and etc. But we say that this is not enough, right? So my first speaker already gave you a preemptive on why bank is not enough. And like, for example, there are things such as um, inflation and don't buy their case about 5% uh, interest because this is not enough, right? Because a majority of the people still are unable to fulfill their basic needs. And hence, we believe that the, at, at the end of the day, it is still um, not accessible under their side of the house. Going to my first argument on why skill sets are much more important. Now, panels, in the, first, uh, in the 21st century, things such as degrees wouldn't matter as much anymore because a majority of the people that have graduated from universities would opt into other kinds of jobs, right? With this reason, we believe that you need additional skill sets. You need uh, linguistic skills. You need new um, skill sets that can be achieved from uh, learning courses and um, investing your money into getting these courses, right? Two reasons for this. First of all, the job market is more competitive. Not only that it is more competitive, right. but yeah, okay. Uh, not only that it is more competitive, but there are actually more diverse job market at the moment. Now, under our side of the house, we want to fulfill these demands and diversify our portfolio, and it is impossible under their side of the house. So when, for example, a person such as a scientist um, is working on uh, their own degree, we say that it is better under our side to invest money, uh, a huge portion of our saving for them to, to learn and opt into medical courses, which takes, yeah, for example, a couple of years. Automatically, this makes it so much uh, better and so much easier for this individual to opt into two fields of jobs. So even if their career gets wrecked, uh, they can opt into other jobs, for example, become a nurse or a doctor and et cetera. In comparison, this is not uh, possible under their side of the house because they're only going to focus on one career. They're only going to try to maintain that stability that they have without looking into other options, for example. And um, this means that it is also basically impossible for them to have a better quality of life because they're only going to focus on saving 80% of their income while they still have to struggle and fulfill things such as rent, bills, food, and uh, etc. Second reason on why more competition means that you need to uh, increase your quality of skill sets panels, we believe that even if you want to pursue a job within the same uh, degrees that you already have, this is much harder to do, right? Because especially for minorities and lower class working people, such as my, oh, such as what my first uh, speaker have told you, for these kinds of people, they have to opt into much lower quality universities, for example, right? Uh, and at the end of the day, they have to compete with other kinds of universities that already has a huge name, for example, Harvard. And we say that under our side, investing directly into the economy or like investing into yourself is much better because you have you have um, something that you you can use to compete against these kinds of uh, privileged people. Going to my second argument on how basic necessities for lower class and middle class can be fulfilled better under our side. Panels, what you need to understand is that this um, this narrative can only be realistically achievable when you put it into higher working class people or a portion of the middle class working people, right? Because first of all, let's look at the first class and middle class working people. These kinds of people, let's, uh, for example, the first class people, they have businesses, they have investments, they don't have to struggle at all. And, and at the end of the day, all of their materialistic needs are already fulfilled. Secondly, on middle class, uh, middle class working or middle working class people, we can assume that these people have stable income and their wages are actually average, right? For example, in Indonesia, these people have um, fulfilled their UMR. Uh, but even this is not enough under their side of the house because they still have to sacrifice things such as happiness, entertainment, and etc. So opposition side has to explain to us why sacrificing short-term happiness, better food, better quality of life is better. Uh, it is okay under their side in comparison um, in comparison to under our side where we can achieve that and also achieve, for example, financial stability. Going to my first layer on why middle class is less sustainable. Panels, as a middle working class citizen, you need to pay bills, rent, food, necessities, and etc. These would literally cost a lot already, right? But not only that, keep in mind that the middle cl uh, class working citizen, you also have to do, uh, you, you also have other priorities such as paying loans, house loans, apartments, car loans, and etc. Hence, it is nearly impossible for you to save up 80% of your money. And even if they, uh, they want to do so, they would be pressured, such as what my first speaker have told you, and they have to cut off um, excess spendings on food, right? For example, when uh, you have more money, you can opt into healthier foods. Whereas under their side of the house, if you if you want to uh, jump into this narrative as a lower working class citizen, you have to opt into you have to um, 
live a lifestyle that is way more unhealthy. For example, eating instant food for the sake of reaching that, uh, for the sake of saving money. Second, on why it is impossible for working class people. Opposition side talks to you about how they want uh, the lower working class people uh, to save up money and focus on retirement, right? Because they say that uh, retirement is like, uh, will guarantee you happiness. But we say that it is not urgent for lower working class people to focus on retirement because this is not the first thing that comes into their mind when, when it comes to money. What, what comes to their mind is that they want a short-term financial security on, for example, how, are, how they're able to afford their next meal, how are they able to pay their gas and etc. And on top of that, lower working class people have the hardest kinds of jobs, right? Because they have to, for example, physically put their body on the line when they build houses and like, um, uh, yeah, just basically uh, blue collared kind of jobs where they have to physically put their uh, uh, body on the line. Hence, we say that giving them access to more entertainment is actually better because they, uh, at least under their side, they won't be as much stressed. Going to my last argument on why happiness is better achieved under our side. So my first speaker already told you that there is no certainty when it comes to happiness after you've been retired, right? But we say, uh, first layer is that we say that short-term happiness is much better and can only be achieved under our side, right? Not only short-term happiness, but happiness in general. What you get under government side is that people, uh, people have the freedom to allocate their funds, for example, spend money on traveling, drinks, fine dining, going out, and etc. On the contrary, opposition side, uh, gives you alternatives such as um, try uh, having ha happiness or the narrative of happiness on the old age. But we say that this is not effective because you can only get happiness once you already grow old, right? But we say that under our side, what, what we want to prioritize is that we want to prioritize happiness when you, have, when you are still on your prime age, when you're still on your 20 years old, when you're still youthful and you're actually physically capable to enjoy things such as sports, or like expensive sports hobbies, uh, traveling around the world, and etc. And we say that there, it is simply not possible under, under their side of the house when they're already old and it is harder for them to opt into um, happiness. That's all for me, thank you. Thank you to the DPM for that speech. Now I would like to welcome the DLO to deliver theirs. Here, here. Hi, am I audible and visible? Yep, both. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll take verbal PS5. Think of a piggy bank, right? Kids are taught to save money. One coin every day. This stops the child from spending coins too recklessly, spending money on ice cream every chance they get. If they get more than one coin a day, they can choose to spend that extra money. But this gives them that security blanket that is necessary because the fact of the matter is without this piggy bank, these kids would have no coins at all. What does OP want? We think for any chance of happiness, we need the insurance of safety. I'm gonna talk about three areas in the speech. First on financial stability, second on personal happiness, and lastly an additional point on how we improve the economy. First, I have one clarification though. Prop team is completely inconsistent in their characterization. Self-improvement versus reckless spending is this tightrope they keep on pulling, right? We think if you claim people will be responsible with the way they spend their disposable income, people will be responsible enough to have enough money for their literally basic and essential necessities on our side. We think they'll have enough money for groceries, that they'll have enough money for rent. It is absolutely ludicrous that the characterization that DPM wants to push is one of people being completely responsible on their side while completely reckless on our side. That is completely unfair and we do not stand for that. First clash then on financial stability. First, I want to talk about this point that the first brought up about societal backlash. Note that this was dropped by the second because they realized how ridiculous this point is. First, it's not true at all, right? Your neighbor doesn't know what your bank account looks like. There's no guarantee that other people will know what you're doing with your savings and what you're doing with the money. Even if you do get this backlash though, which they don't explain why it's possible, who cares? The mom probably has bigger problems on her hands than what her neighbor thinks of her. She probably has to think of what she has to feed her kids, how to bring her kids to school, right? It's not a big urgency in this case. The bigger urgency here is financial stability. So with that point awash, first layer on financial stability. What will people actually spend their money on? Prop claims these middle to low income people will use money on their side for things like self-improvement. Their only logical reasoning to prove this is that there's a capitalistic notion where people never feel good about themselves and want to be better. 
panel, they completely misunderstand this concept. The capitalistic machine is literally what makes them want to spend money on bags and luxury items. That is literally the point of this machine, to give money back to corporations. Oh, so if your argument is capitalism, no, makes people buy real estate, that isn't true at all. The benefits that they tote and that they claim only apply to the rich. What type of low-income family can afford to buy a chunk of land with just a bit of disposable income? Capitalism is harmful for the poor and benefits the rich. That is exactly the point of it. Exactly because of the capitalism capitalist machine, they buy cigarettes, they buy expensive bags. Clearly, panel, they stab themselves in the back with this point. Secondly, let's talk about investment and skills, right? This isn't exclusive at all. There's a level of division that you have here. Education will always be a factor in how much they save, and obviously this percentage will shift, shift from each person to fit their needs. Even if we don't allow these people to afford these other classes, though, that's okay, because you don't need to pay to take a computer science course to learn how to do computer science anymore. There are things like YouTube. There are things like free sites. There are things like your friends or your teachers who will teach you that thing for free. You can do this for free. We don't think you need any... Uh, uh, a, a huge investment of money in this anyway. So why do we give it to them better? Because we give them a level of financial security they need when they're improving their education. Take their own example, right? Coding classes. You're not actively making lots of income and even the jobs that you get after that aren't, aren't necessarily guaranteed because it's a very competitive field. So you need the buffer of financial security exactly because you don't have that financial security when you're being educated. So comparatively, panel on this class, what we give is clearly more financial stability. And even in the case of future development, we give them that necessary security security blanket. Second point, though, on happiness, and this is a big positive case that they try to push that we think doesn't stand all. Let's yeah. take it down step by step. First layer on disposable income. They say people need to enjoy their happiness now. No, there are other ways to find happiness. There's family, there's relationships, there's ways you can spend time with your kids. There's so many other ways to spend to gain happiness. You don't actually need to spend money and buy things to be happy. We actually think it's horrible if you spend money to be happy. Even if they do get that happiness, it is absolutely short term. And this is what my first speaker said, right? It's a boost of serotonin and something that you get addicted to. That's why people buy cigarettes. That's why people get addicted to online shopping and then have to go to therapy, right? Why is our happiness better? Because it's not superficial. It is based on things that are actually giving them meaningful happiness, like family and relationships, instead of people just spending money to gain back things that they feel like they didn't have as a child. They say, second to here, that you don't need to save money for retirement because it's uncertain. Wrong. First, there's very large cases of elder abuse that happens a lot, right? There's companies that scam elders. There's companies that harm these elders for their money. There's, there's instances in which in retirement, you need this money as a safety bench just because there's a lot of exploitation that happens if you don't. Even if this doesn't happen, though, and even in the non-extreme cases, you need income just to live day to day. These elders don't have any source of income coming to them. They can't, they can't rely on their kids to give them a source of income. They need to be mutually independent in order to actually survive and get food in the first place. So we think, yes, you do need to save for retirement because it is absolutely certain that you won't have income in that part of your life. When you are talking about retirement and people who are 80 years old plus, they need that money in order to live a comfortable lifestyle and in order to actually get food and be able to survive in the first place. Second point here that they say is that they have stress when saving money. We think this is literally ridiculous because you're stressed when you don't have any money to fall back on. Literally take the pandemic that we're in, right? People who didn't have that extra savings and that extra security blanket got stressed because they didn't have that money in their bank account because they couldn't afford the electricity bill because they were in their house all day, because they couldn't afford paying for their mother's health care when, when she got COVID, right? That is exactly what gives you stress. We don't think not having money will ever not be stressful. So panel on this point on happiness, yeah. we clearly give people less stress and we give people more disposable income. Before I get into my extension on why we improve the economy, sure, POI. Given that money depreciates, which is an argument you did not rebut at all, why is it better to save in the bank rather than invest? This brings me perfectly to my extension on why we improve the economy. You said that the money does nothing in the bank, right? That it doesn't actually create a return of investment. We think this is wrong. First, just on the scope of society, with savings, people literally contribute to the economy. And here, Econ 101, when people save money, those savings are generally loaned to businesses to, find, to finance to invest, right? For example, an individual's 401k is saving vehicle for their future consumption after retirement. But before retirement, those funds are generally invested in various companies through the purchase of stocks and bonds. Why is this important? Because it's a trickle-down effect to the rest of the economy. You give a boost, and you actually help small businesses that need it. So it's not only on a personal level, it's on a societal level that helps other people and helps the economy as well. And when you help the economy, obviously the country's welfare gets better because GDP gets higher. So why is this better than investing in stocks or real estate? Because the saver automatically gets a 5% interest 
interest rates without any risk of investing stocks themselves. What Prop doesn't understand here is that when you're putting money in a bank, it is very secure. There is no way that you are going to lose that money. What happens when you put it in a bank is you actually get 3% or even 5% of that money back yearly when these people are lending it out to other people. You will always get that money bank back because that's how banks work. That is literally their selling point, right? What happens when you're investing it in stocks though is that it's absolutely volatile. Um, and first, we want to say that vulnerable actors don't know who to invest in. They will literally listen to, listen to random advice online or from their friends. We think it's unfair to push this narrative investing to the poor people who aren't really educated enough or know enough about stocks in general to be able to do this well, right? Rich people often have hedge fund managers to help them. It's completely unrealistic to expect an individual to know what to do. Even if they do know, stocks are insanely volatile, and this is something that a poor person literally cannot handle in terms of their financial stability. By telling people to get rid of their piggy banks, you are, you are ruining their financial stability. Okay, so that then would conclude the second exchange in the round. Uh, similarly to Daniel, I'm going to share my notes on how I jot it down and then also give you my take on the observations in the round. Uh, just importantly, worth noting, my notes are significantly different from Daniel's. And again, I think this is indicative of the fact that there isn't one correct way to track debates. Uh, I, for example, so I will just show from the second speaker, I don't use a table, at least not when I'm typing. I find it easier to just type downwards. There are obviously a lot of typos as well, <laughs> uh, different from Daniel, but this is because I prioritize, for instance, catching the material, and even if it's not spelled correctly or it's not grammatically correct, it's fine. And I also struggle to format online in a time, uh, timelessly. So I prioritize just getting the material down. I do have an overarching format though, wherein I would start with the introduction that the speaker initially uses, because I think introductions are quite useful for the framing of the debate. I summarize that in my own form of shorthand. So if someone says something's like not equivalent, I you know say equal with a dash in between, to indicate to me that this is someone saying that this is not equivalent to that. And then I use sub points and move on in that manner. Other things to note is I also do gut chat material as I'm writing it, just because I think either one, if this is something that the other team can easily respond to, I think it's worth flagging, at least in my own mind. But secondly, there are also certain reasons why even if a, an argument is not strong in and of itself, um, and it does not get responded to, you can still incorporate that when you are assigning speaker scores at the end of the debate or at the end of the speech, for example. So for example, I, in my back of my mind, I'm not, I, I'm not clear on the proposition line that goes that individuals can use these skills to achieve other careers in case their job goes, um, you know, does not go well. And so for me, I, in those instances, I will put in brackets right next to the claim a note for myself along with a question mark. So I'm unclear as to how they, on proposition, there's perfect labor mobility, wherein if you are studying science, you can become a doctor if your science career does not work out, for instance. And I think this is something that needs to be more mechanized a bit more. This is perfectly fine and permissible because you are judging as the average informed voter. Average informed voters do not just believe everything uncompromising or unquestioningly, you are able to interrogate certain things. Of course, this does not factor into which side wins the debate. It's a, like in and of itself, it's just a way for me to note for myself what are some of the things that I found questionable within the round and some of the things that I think make this the, determine the quality of the speech. Uh, and the final thing to note with regards to my uh, notes is I do also at the end just give an overarching like bracket that I would score the speech at. So do I think this is a above average speech and below average speech. This is a preliminary score. At the end of the round, I do go again and check my notes and given for the information of how the clashes play out, I may adjust that slightly, but this is an initial inclination about the quality of the speech and how I think it contributed to the round. We will talk about scoring also a bit later, more a bit later, uh, but essentially these are my notes. So clearly a lot different. Mine are perhaps not as tidy. Mine are not a direct comparison between two different speakers, but what mine do is prioritize getting down the content that the speakers are trying to convince their panel of. And given that I personally would struggle to 
format in real time, I prioritize just getting that down, even if it's not the most tidy. Again, each individual has their own uh, sorry note taking style, and there's something that you do grow through um, trial and error, which you should definitely be experimenting with. Okay. Uh, and now with the assessment of the clashes and how the run progresses, I think this is a very good debate for this kind of exercise because I think it illustrates shifts in momentum and how cases can change in the debate or can evolve to become stronger. So I would agree, as Daniel pointed out, that of the first exchange, the proposition was probably ahead on both questions. Firstly, on what is the nature of this expenditure going to look like in the counterfactual, so i.e. without this narrative, and secondly, on the question of on which side are minorities or just individuals and their happiness maximized. I do think in the second speech or in the second exchange, momentum shifts a lot more towards the opposition. And I want to note for three distinct reasons. One, I think there's a lack of progression of the pre-existing material on the proposition bench. I find the P2 to be largely repetitive of the material that already existed in the P1 without necessarily either A, providing explicitly different like contributions and progressions, or two, trying to at least tell me as a judge why I should weigh this argument more, or why I should weigh the material mechanisms that they provide in the argument more. The second thing that I'll also note there is a relatively less amount of responses on the P2 to the O1 than there is to the, from the O2 to the entire of the proposition team. P2 prioritizes the response to the idea of individuals spending this money, excuse me, on certain things such as vices, but also the only external rebuttal is to say banks are insufficient because 5% is not going to be enough. My first speaker already tells you why it does not meet up with inflation. This extraneous rebuttal, although there is further like integration, integrated responses within his own, within the speaker's own speech, I still think this is insufficient, just given the amount of doubt that is at least caused by the first opposition speaker. I would have appreciated a lot more responsive work, but I also think they prioritize the least contentious expert of the opposition case to deal with. Owen's major impact of the speech was to suggest that vulnerable individuals such as the elderly or such as those who are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are unable to access the happiness that the proposition argues for if they do not save. P2 instead responds to the minor mechanism on the opposition, at least after 01, to suggest that the 5% interest rates does not keep up with inflationary pressure in a manner that is quite repetitive of the P1 already. The third thing, is I would say that I think in terms of substantive material, the P2 also does not progress the debate further. They claim to have three different responses, but I think the analysis and mechanisms are largely derivative of the P1, again, without any explicit progression being shown. This is contrasted to the opposition second speaker, who I think in this debate does a lot of work to pull the momentum towards the opposition team. Firstly, I think they are a lot more responsive to some of the stronger claims on proposition that existed from the P1, which Daniel already pointed out that OWA does not really respond to. For example, I think they give greater reasoning and further analysis on why it is likely to be the case that individuals do not invest in self-advancement, uh, self or why even if self-advancement is something that people can invest in, it ought not be something that people spend a lot of money on. So just in terms of the prioritization of the speeches themselves, as well as the amount of contribution that both speak, second speakers add to the round, I think on opposition, there's a lot more attempts at being more analytical, excuse me, and being a lot more progressive than there is on proposition. And this goes a long way with regards to shifting the momentum in favor of the opposition at this point in the round. So how then do I track the two questions or the material under the two questions at the end of these two speeches? And the first idea about where these money or where in the absence of this counterfactual or this narrative where the money will be spent on, on the counterfactual, I think in P2, what we get is largely assertive uh, analysis or assertive claims. They assert that it is insufficient, for example, for individuals to have degree like university qualifications and that a way for them to differentiate themselves would be through the additional skills that they can acquire, such as linguistics. And I think here, they don't really tie it down to why it is that individuals who, who are particularly from low, low socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, which is the main stakeholder that both sides seem to be prioritizing at this point in the debate, are actually going to be incentivized to do this. They seem to just assert that this is important, but I don't think there is really a link from BP2 as to why this is far more likely to be what's going to materialize. 
Secondly, though, they also say that this is important to hedge against like economic volatility. So you, if you lose your job or your career does not go as well. But, but my problem here is that whereas this is similar to what already existed in the P1, the problem here is that it is framed a lot more towards individuals accessing things that are necessary for survival, things such as paying for rent, things such as paying for food. And I'm unclear as to why it is a fair burden to implicitly push on the opposition to defend individuals spending money or rather saving money when they've not yet met their basic needs. Presumably the framing on both sides, as is also pointed out, is such that we're talking about saving disposable income, i.e. after you've paid your taxes, presumably also after you've paid your rent. So I'm unclear as to why then this is the, necess the necessity for us to regret this uh, narrative, such that individuals are doing things such as literally paying for food that they need to eat. So the framing posited by the P2 is something that I find less persuasive. And so not only is there not enough progression from the P2, I also think there's actual case regression, given that they are pushing forward analysis that, I, that is not actually quite salient or quite logically proven to be true. The other thing that, they then, uh, that we then get from the P2 under this idea of where the money will go to in the absence of this um, narrative that exists in the status quo is the idea that uh, individuals are probably now better able to access uh, to access benefits that will help them in not just the short term but also the long term. So things such as paying off your debts, for instance, which would be a, a long term benefit for individuals because if you're less debt indebted, that would be something that's quite good for you as well. But again, this falls into the same problem with regards to the framing of the round as to why is this the case necessarily that. Uh, individuals are unable to do this because of the narrative that exists. And there also isn't, I think, sufficient defensive work here because O1 casts doubt on the idea that people face pressure and stigma under this narrative because your neighbors don't really know about your bank details. No one can like, shame you for how you choose to spend your money. The P2 does not respond to this and does not do any defensive work here. So I think I mean, the first question then on what is this money going to be spent towards, although the Proposition 1's material about self advancement is still standing, the Proposition 2 fails to really add on to this, and in some instances actually undercuts the benefits or the plausibility of this material there. Contrasting this to the opposition, who I think in O2, we get a lot more reasoned, as Daniel pointed out, O1 really does not give structural reasons as why people will spend this on vices. I think on O2, we get these these analytical gaps filled in to suggest why it's actually not true that individuals will be prioritizing things such as self-advancement, right? Firstly, they attack the capitalist incentive that P1 had framed and set up around and to suggest that this is actually the reason why, contrary to individuals becoming more financially savvy, they'll probably would spend on short-term benefits or more materialistic things that give you a serotonin rush, but do not actually enhance your life in the long term. Secondly, they also say that in order for individuals to be financially uh, stable, what is probably likely to be beneficial for them is to save up because the way in which proposition argues their benefits does not materialize, i.e. poor people cannot afford to do things such as buy real estate to set up businesses. This is something that would only apply to the rich and therefore the, the benefit that the proposition is trying to claim or the counterfactual that proposition is trying to claim rather of individuals spending their money on things for self-enhancement advancement is unlikely to materialize. I think this is a strong bit of reputation that takes down the stronger speech on the proposition case as well, at least not completely, but takes, uh, significantly undercuts a strong uh, piece of analysis that we got from the proposition. And here's why, again, it is detrimental that the P2 does not do much rebuilding or progressive work in their speech. Um, the third thing that I think the opposition to is able to do is also add nuance as to what a significant portion of savings is, and points out that it's unlikely to be this hard and fast amount but rather it can shift based on individual's income and based on what they need. But the, what remains salient is that individuals should be able to perhaps save and prioritize some sort of future financial stability. This is important because a huge chunk of the proposition's material was conjured up on saying that there's a disproportionate pressure on people who don't earn as much to save a lot more than they are likely to be, uh, than it's likely to be possible for them to save. And this is significantly undermining that proposition line. So I think, O2, by the start of 
within the first like three minutes of their speech engages with the strongest bits of the proposition case, whereas contrastingly, P2 does not engage with the strongest bits of the opposition case. And this is a large part of the reason why the momentum is shifting. On the second clash on happiness, proposition two gives the response to say, we don't want people to be happy. And this is integrated in their third point. People should not only preserve their happiness for once they have retired, because at that point, their peak years are beyond, are beyond behind them and they can't necessarily um, access that happiness as much. We would rather that they do it in their youth. I think this argument itself has a bit of a problem for me because I'm unsure why happiness is dependent on your age. I think that is an assumption that the proposition ju is just like asserting throughout the round and it's not justified in any instance. But I also think that this is flipped by the O2 when they point out, for example, that for people, particularly those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds need more choices and when you access more choices when you have a lot more financial backing and a safety net which savings provide for you. So if the proposition's impact is on happiness, I think opposition is able to, at least at this point, so significantly show that this happiness does not materialize to the greatest extent or to as great an extent as a proposition wants, given that individuals do not have this safety like a safety blanket of having savings. I think then opposition furthers, oppositions too furthers this a lot more. When they argue why firstly, individuals probably need to be saving a lot more money in order to hedge against the worst outcomes that can exist in a capitalist world. So things like becoming addicted to online shopping. Secondly, the idea that people are actually likely to be a lot more stressed if they don't have financial security and in light of like the COVID example where people without savings were the ones who were worse hit. But thirdly, also then the idea that for a lot of, for a significant portion or for a very significant stakeholder in the debate, they need financial independence, i.e. those who are in retirement need the ability to be able to be self-sufficient and to be independent, given that you can't always rely on the state or on your family. This is material that already exists in O1, but I think it's impacted a lot more strongly in the O2. And thus, this is also something that you could potentially credit in O2. The last thing that I think opposition second does is attack the one of the last standing pillars, at least at this point of the proposition case, which is the idea that uh, saving is passive and you don't really do anything with it, whereas you could, on the contrast, invest that money and, and improve the amount of returns that you get on this. And this is both the POI response as well as the third substantive material in P2, in O2, sorry, where they point out that it's actually not the case. People saving in their in bank accounts means that banks have greater ability to finance things such as loans, which have overarching trickle-down benefits for the whole economy. But secondly, it's also safer given that things such as stocks and investments are either A, volatile, or B, most individuals don't have the knowledge and the know-how to financially and safely engage with this. This again cuts across the existing P1 material about why it's better to do things like invest your income and get more returns from it. So by the end of the second speaker ex exchange, the momentum has shifted towards the opposition team, whereas in by the first speaker exchanges, the, the uh, momentum was lying with the proposition. I think this debate is quite good at highlighting the importance of tracking rounds as it happens, and also not just relying on the initial iterations of arguments, but seeing how speakers down the bench are able to either progress or impact pre-existing material in a manner that can shift the momentum oftentimes in, uh, oftentimes in debates. And so oftentimes debates aren't static and the more you are able to have an overarching, uh, create overarching clashes after the first exchange, but then evaluate or rather reassess and reevaluate who who is ahead in terms of those clashes by the end of the next exchange. And so at this point in the debate as it stands, Opposition is probably ahead on both clashes, given that they first proved that the counterfactual of individual spending money on self-improvement is unlikely to be what is realistic, but B, they're also able to point out that individual happiness is better maximized if they have a larger safety net, given that on the comparative one proposition, they are um, far more likely to face things such as uh, economic downturn and become more vulnerable to that, which is incredibly stressful. And there are also non-monetary means of you achieving that happiness. So at this point in the debate, the opposition is probably ahead um, at this point. Okay, uh, yeah, that then would conclude our section on tracking of the debates. Uh, I don't know if Daniel or anyone wants to say anything before we move on to the scoring aspect. Okay, great. 
finally, then we are going to briefly discuss the scores that we believe the speakers would have gotten. But before that, just a couple of scoring guidelines that are quite important to bear in mind when you are scoring debates. These are, of course, uh, in addition to the judge briefings, which you should be reading in full, but this is just a quick sort of uh, illustration of what some of the things that are important with regards to scoring. Okay, so some scoring guidelines and what to avoid when you are scoring speeches. The first thing would be poorly calibrated scores. And this means do not cons consistently overscoring or consistently underscoring speeches. In the past four or five years, the speaking the speaker average of the top 10 speakers at Worlds have not gone beyond like 74.5. And so this means that yes, individuals can have individual speeches where they give perhaps a speech of a 74 quality or a 75 quality even. But on that, it is highly unlikely that you as a judge are going to be in rooms where you have individuals that are always giving you speeches that are of the quality of the world's best speaker of any given year. So it's very unlikely that you are in a room where, or you are always in a room where everyone is completely exceptional and could be the best speaker in the world. And it's also similarly quite unlikely that you're in a room where individuals are going to be you know, completely appalling and not really strong speakers. So being mindful about how you're calibrating your scores is important, especially because given the way in which speaker scores are the determining factor of where teams rank, uh, it's a very strong determining factor of the way teams rank, and of course of the way speakers rank, you want to be as fair as possible, and that means taking the time to really calibrate your speaks. Give yourself time to first assess, for example, if you think this was an above average round, or, and then consider whether or not this was an above average speech and then score according to that, as opposed to either being a consistently high scorer or a consistently low scorer, there's nothing to be gained from either one of those situations. The second thing is a lack of differentiation between speakers. So it is highly unlikely that down the bench or down the team that all, speaker, all speakers will score the same. So even if they are, give speeches that are similar in quality, it is oftentimes possible to distinguish between what contributes the most to a debate and to the eventual core of the debate. And given that, you should be distinguishing between speakers. WSCC allows for half points, for example. So even if you think both speech, all the speeches from the proposition bench were above average and quite good, there are ways in which you can be above average to different extents. So you could give a 71.5, a 72, and a 72.5 accounting for those variations between the speakers is something that you should be doing and is something that again increases the fairness and the accuracy of your scores the third thing to avoid is a lack of correlation between substantive speech scores and reply speech scores by this it's to say that given that the reply speech is given by either the first prop or the second oh, sorry the first or the second speaker on either side it's highly unlikely that the same speaker within the same debate can give you a below average speech and an exceptional speech. So this would look like an instance where perhaps this is a bit extreme, but someone could score a 69 for their P second P2 speech, but then be given a 37 for their reply speech. That implies, a 37 reply speech implies that it is a 74 speech. So it is highly unlikely that an individual speaker is going to grow or give you a variance of five speaker scores within the same debate. That is highly unlikely. And this is oftentimes a quick way for you to check whether or not you're applying the score correctly. Because sometimes people think that something is a pretty exceptional, but for some reason would um, dampen down the substantive speaker score and then give an exceptional score for the reply speech. That is not really ideal and is oftentimes indicative of a misunderstanding or a misapplication of the speaker skill. So just be mindful to check that as well. The fourth thing is not crediting role fulfillment. Role fulfillment and speakers doing essentially what is, is necessary, like ex, ex, doing what is exclusively required of them is something to be credited. That is to say that even if they don't do it particularly well, if as a second speaker, they have refutation, they do rebuilding and deposit a with some extension to their case, these are things that you have to credit. 
So oftentimes there are judges who are quite punitive on speakers who don't do anything particularly well. Even if a speaker does not, is not particularly great at style, is not particularly great with content, so long as they show an understanding and an appreciation of it at the most elementary and like what is required basic level, that's something that you do have to credit. So, so long as a speech is clear, addresses all or most of the important aspects of the debate, as well as provides argumentation and slash or rebuttal without any obvious or glaring logical gaps, this has to be credited. Oftentimes, this is what we mean by an average speech. An average speech is a speech that does all that it is required of it as per the WSDC manual and the speaker roles. So you also should be crediting role fulfillment. This doesn't mean over credit role fulfillment. It just means factor that in. Did the speaker do what was actually required of them? And this is oftentimes a buffer against exceptionally low scores because oftentimes if a speaker, even if they don't sufficiently refute the other team, if they do what is required of them, it might mean that they are a 68 or a 69 as opposed to a 65 or a 66. So be mi being mindful of that when you are scoring would also be very useful. And so just a quick checks that you can go through. The first one, uh, simple checks, ask yourself, what would an average score in, sound like in a debate speech? And then move up and down according to who you believe was below or above average. To score reply speeches, assess it like a regular speech and then divide that score by two. This would also prevent the lack of co uh, correlation between a substantive speech and a reply speech. Do use half marks. Half marks are allowed as the lowest fraction, and you can give half a point, especially to differentiate between speakers down the bench. And then after telling the scores, the total score of the winning team must be higher than the score of the losing team. You can't have low point wins. And if this is happening, it means you need to reassess what's happening. Again, from our conferral judge training, we spoke about how scores are a mathematical representation of what you believe to happen in the round. So what you believe happened in the round comes first. You first decide on your winner and then you assign scores after that. Okay, and then lastly, just to be mindful about your margins. So how close did you think the debate was? And this would also help you calibrate your scores. If you think it was a difference of, if you think it was a very close debate, you'll probably have a difference of like 0 0.5 to two speaker points. Close but clear, you would have three to five speaker scores. One team is clearly better, but they're not necessarily dominating. You can have between five to 10 speaker scores. If you have a domination of one team, then you'd have things be margins of like 10 to 20. Anything beyond that, it was clearly an unfair matchup and also very unlikely to occur, especially with the use of power pairing. Your margins are quite unlikely to be as um, drastic, especially as the tournament progresses. So these are all things to consider. Of course, a lot of it and a lot of scoring is subjective, but so long as you are informed and you are logically applying the speaker scale, it should be good, at least for the most part. And it means that the speaks that you do give are an accurate and fair reflection for the integrity of the tournament. And so it's very important for us that you do score adequately. Okay. Uh, and so to conclude this video, we'll have a brief discussion on our speaker scores for the four speeches that we saw, as well as a brief reason as to why those would be the cases. Okay, uh, I can go first and share my speaker scores as well as brief reason, reasonings for why. So for the P1, I would give a 72. I think the speech was on, on overall above average. The speaker was able to utilize style as well quite effectively at certain points, and I was able to show a good appreciation for strategy, i.e. by framing out certain aspects, talking about how symmetrically on either side, for example, wealthy people are the ones who probably benefit the most from this narrative. And as such, it's something that needs or be regretted, sets up a clear counterfactual, and is quite engaging and preemptive of a lot of the things that come out. I do think there are some issues with the analysis, for example, the labor mobility issue, I think still exists even in the P1 speech because I'm unclear as to why these online courses are enough to compensate for a whole career or university degree. But overall, I don't think it's damaging or it's too damaging to the speech. And I do think this was a solid speech and I'll give it a 72. For the O1, I would give a 71 perhaps. I think is able to identify the important issues in the debate and does cast some doubt on certain things, but not quite as strong as the, P2, as the o P1 with regards to their use of um, 
with regards to their use of strategy, for example, so they misprioritize what I think are the most important things to respond to from the proposition. And they also don't really weigh material. And as a responsive speaker, I do think you have a bit of a burden to show why your responses are important when you are dealing with another team. So don't just say stuff, but actually explain the, the relevance and the severity it has to, for the case that the other team ran. For the P2, I would give a 70. I think that was an average speech, showed a good understanding of role fulfillment and, what, and did attempt to uh, flip some of the impact of some of the material that we got from the opposition one. I don't think this was necessarily done quite successfully. I also did additionally have problems with the structure of the speech, i.e. when they tried to integrate responses at certain points, it was not flagged as such. And so despite the extraneous rebuttal at the top of their speech, which I believe was also a misprioritization of the important issues beyond that within the internal speech itself, it's quite hard to flow. But I do think there are sufficient attempts at responding and also at progressing the case, even though I don't fully buy it. So I credit it mostly on a role for women aspect and an awareness of what is required in the debate. And thus I would score that a 70. For the opposition second, I would score somewhere between a 72.5 to a 73. Uh, just because I think a lot of good, strong responses come out and they're also strategically aware of what are the most important parts from the proposition case to refute while simultaneously rebuilding their own material, for example, but why it is likely that individuals fall into the consumption of vices as opposed to investing that money wisely. And lastly, also gives an independent uh, part to victory in terms of their substantive material, which I think is quite a strong piece of substantive as well, which is impacted on two levels with regards to benefit the like overarching economy, but second with regards to benefiting the individual. So that's how I would score the speeches at this point with opposition slightly ahead at, by the end of the first two speeches. Okay, uh, Daniel, if you want to share your scores, please. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, so I agree with a lot that Eric had said about the scoring. Uh, for me, I think for P1, I score P1 slightly higher, which is 72.5, so 0 0.5 point higher. I think P1 was generally an above average speech, uh, stylistically very clear. I think what was really good at P1 is the strategy, as in they put a lot of preemptive, a lot of really strategic burden pushing, like what is within the burden of proposition proof and what is within the burden of obsession to prove. I think in terms of content, I, I do see really well elaborated mechanisms as well. Uh, but I do agree that some material were quite jumpy and I pick on the same material. Like uh, there's this specific line that if you take a, a computer science course in Coursera, you can be a software engineer. <laughs> I think the process was a bit jumpy. I think definitely could have been better, but I think overall was a really good speech. I think uh, there's a lot of preemption that strategically tackle opposition potential case. I also do think uh, the mechanism were well explained. Uh, for O1, I was slightly a bit harsh. Uh, so uh, I, I, I scored O170, uh, so 0 0.5 point lower. I do think O1 was uh, stylistically less effective in a sense that there were a lot of repetitions. Uh, I do think the strategy was the one that made the point quite low for me. I think out of all mechanisms that Prop brought, uh, they chose to rebut on societal backlash, which number one was not even the major contribution of Prop, but also number two, it undercut their own benefit. Uh, as what I've explained in the OA. So I, I ju just thought the strategy was a bit poor here. I also do think in terms of content, they didn't really elaborate on a lot of assertions. For example, like they just asserted that short-term happiness is bad without telling me why, without weighing why long-term happiness is more important. So basically they just said long-term happiness is important because you need safety net and happiness is falling upon the definition of stability, but there's no reason why. Also, like the reason why people recklessly spend, they only assert one reason, which is capitalist notion makes people tend to spend. I don't think there's any other illustration rather than that in comparison to what we have got from the P1. Uh, for the P2, I score slightly higher, which is 70.5, so 0 0.5 point higher. I think I agree. I think the style was a bit bad uh, because I think. Uh, 
there were no like focal variation to really emphasize which part is important or not. Uh, so I think in most cases, the important material might have been underlooked. I think content wise, I think I agree with Eric. It was a bit all over the place. Like, I don't think the structure was good. The thing that I like from P2 though, is the way towards the end. And so why happiness in the present ought to be prioritized than happiness in the future. When they did mention that the uh, ability of hum of people to enjoy the happiness in the present is much more intense, given that they are still quite youthful in comparison when they're old, there are a lot of physical complications that prevent individual to uh, enjoy the result of their money. And therefore, I, I do think those points of way were actually pretty good. Like it was not stylistically convincing, but it also like in structure was a bit all over the place. And that's why I think uh, 70.5. Lastly, on O2, I agree with Eric. I think it was a really good speech. I scored it as 72.5 until 73 as well. So the same with Eric. I think it's stylistically very convincing. Content-wise, I think they did fill a lot of holes left by opposition one. I do think they also rebutted a lot of things that could have been rebutted since O1 to the P1 and P2 speech, I also do think extension was a bit smart. So I like O2 and I do think it was an above average speech as well. Uh, yep, that's from me. Okay, so I think um, I can speak quite briefly on what speaker points I specifically had in this area. So, um, and just to avoid repetition for, Prop one, I had, yeah, sorry, I had prop one at 71.5, which I think is slightly higher than Daniel and um, maybe within the range of um, Eric. So I thought that it was a really good speech. So yeah, sorry, actually slightly lower than Daniel. So I thought that this was a really good speech. I thought that one, they were able to first, uh, again, do a lot of like preemptive engagement. I think they did well in establishing like the main clashes because I think throughout the debate, you note that um, some of the stances that are noted by P1 generally are the most engaged within the debate, right? Telling us about why this is something that's generally going to have like more stability and more happiness. I think I wasn't necessarily, I mean, I, mean, I think in terms of not necessarily having um, that high of a speaker score, even though I think a lot of these arguments are like really well explained and nuanced, I think Prop 1 could have done a bit more in terms of impacting this specifically to how this is most likely going to affect um, individuals, because I think they don't necessarily fully engage and I think this later comes on along the bench as to how specifically this is something that's either going to affect like um, individuals income or households or generally how they're going to engage within society right I think the scope that they fall within is just the aspect that these individuals are going to be happy and so I don't necessarily see what impact this happiness is going to have and, and, and hence they don't necessarily fully impact um, what exactly this happiness looks like and I think even though they have like a lot of strategic arguments on the I mean a lot of strategic arguments on the elements of like stability and happiness I think more impacts could could have could have accrued specifically coming in from P1. Um, op, op 1, I, I gave Op 1 a 71. I think they had a good speech, but I think as um, the two other judge, the two other members have, have talked about, um, one, it was not necessarily as strategic in terms of the issues that they engaged with. I think specifically talking about like societal backlash and those stronger arguments specifically on like happiness and stability. And I think even a lot of claims of why specifically investing in money, right, is something that's not necessarily the the best form of like outcome, right? I don't necessarily think we get the strongest form of engagement from the strongest form of engagement or like the strongest issues coming in from prop one from op one i think also specifically when it comes to um fully developing a lot of ideas right so i don't necessarily think prop op one was able to um develop a lot of like uh, develop a lot of the ideas that generally came about right and i think you'll see this for example when they say how um so, yeah sorry i think you'll see this for example when they said that um individuals are generally like there's going to be like limited income and, and they sort of like going to be a trade-off right and they talk about how to a certain extent you shouldn't you or how on why to a certain extent like disposable income is something that should be limited and the, yeah sorry disposable income is um something that should be limited and in this case invested in something that's like more 
in, in invested in something that's like more sustainable right so they don't necessarily give us as much like as much like justification for example as to why this limitation has to exist right given the fact that prop tells us that to a large extent this limitation is something that can like have um impacts towards like even mental impacts towards the person because it impacts their happiness they live generally in a very like constrained life and they can invest in alternative ways not necessarily just like storing the money in a bank so i think they had a lot of like incomplete ideas which could have been fully developed to be able to like um get them like stronger points right so i think for me it was generally um losing points or not necessarily gaining points in terms of um strategy and specifically on content um when it comes to prop two Sorry, I had prop two at 70.5 and I had, um, yeah, sorry, yeah, prop two at 70.5. So I think prop two um, within, within um, I mean, and this is within context of what prop one had specifically done, right? I think prop one had laid like the groundwork for a lot of like argumentation. And hence, I think what was generally up for prop two is one to do like a lot of like strategic responses specifically um, to a lot of like op up one's claims on why financial stability is something that, for example, can only be specifically um, accessed access through like saving and, and not alternative means, right? I think Prop 2 did a good job in, for example, telling us why their alternatives can still be able to ensure financial stability, but I don't necessarily think they were as comparative in evaluating, for example, where we get more financial stability between the two cases. So I think o to words like the arguments towards how, like how comparative and the level of weighing that I think we got from prop two was something that was significantly less. And I think it could have done a bit more to maybe illustrate why, um, I mean, why, yeah, sorry, to illustrate why maybe um, this narrative is something that's like specifically like very harmful to individuals, right? So I think my general problem with a lot of like Prop 2's case, right, is that they generally assert and try to like develop a lot of their case, but don't fully engage with like Ops case. So they sort of leave the debate like at a balance and they don't show us why they're comparatively better than Op. Um, so Op 2, I had them, I think, with the highest speaker score in the debate. So I had them at 72. And I thought that this was a really good speech because I think one, they were able to like fully develop a lot of arguments that had generally come about um, from, yeah, sorry, from OP1 that hadn't necessarily like been fully developed, right? I think when OP1, for example, talks about like how um, this, the concept, the concept, the concept of instant happiness and why this is something that's not necessarily the best thing, right? I think up to further goes to tell us why then this is something that breeds a sort of like, or, or why this is something that's specifically harmful, right? Because it just breeds a sort of cycle of like spending and constantly using like a lot of this disposable income, right? Which, which then illustrates the harm that this specifically has on like vulnerable individuals. So to that extent, I think a lot of like what OP2 was doing was filling in gaps specifically and impacting a lot of like OPS1 case. And I think this was also done with a lot of strategic responses to like a lot of like um, Prop 1 who I think had like substantively um, stronger material within the debate. So I think to that extent, a lot of like Prop one's engagement, a lot of argument, a lot of um, Prop one's case was fully engaged or was significantly engaged by Op two. Hence, I think for me, in terms of like strategy, in terms of engagement, they did a slightly better job. And even in terms of the content and fully developing a lot of ideas that were sort of left hanging by Op one, they did um, a lot better. Yeah. Okay, and um, thank you. Uh to Daniel and Wairimu for that. Uh, hopefully this video is useful and insightful to all judges with regards to how to track responses, the importance of synthesizing clashes at the end of every exchange and reevaluating them as the debate progresses such that you are not trying to arrive at your initial call only at the end, but you are given the information or rather you're assessing the information that you already have throughout. And lastly, also with regards to scoring calibration, um, all three members of the CAP here do have largely within the same range of scores, and the reasoning is broadly the same. Of course, there is some variance wherein subjectively people would credit certain things more or punish certain things more, but overall it is more or less within the same bracket, and the assessment of these speeches are largely consistent. Of course, this is for this debate. In other debates, this might not be the case. But overall, the idea is that when you are scoring, you are considering the quality of the round, the quality of the individual speeches, and also the contribution that each individual is making to the debate in favor of their side. Yeah, at this point, we will conclude the video. So 
feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or anything which is unclear from this video. But thank you all. And I do hope watching you do watch this and it is useful for you. And yeah, thank you for judging at WCC as well. See you all in a few weeks. Bye-bye.